Welcome to Sunday Night Church. Are you ready to praise Jesus tonight? Come on, let's lift him up. Come on, church, let us see the hands up tonight. Come on, from the front to the back, side to side. Come on, hands up. Come on, let's sing it. Come on, let's sing it together.
If you're thankful tonight, can we lift our hands and sing Oh that rugged cross?
Come on, church. Come on, give him praise and honor. Praise and honor. Come on, lift your voice, church. Shout his name. What a great thing it is to fill your heart with praise for God. Gratitude, appreciation, just thankful heart, a thankful heart. So many great things to thank God for. We should never run out. We should never run out. We should just thank Him. Once you're done thanking Him for all of the crazy, big, hard to explain things, you can get right down to the simplest things, like a little butterfly and a leaf. Thank Him for all kinds of things. All kinds of things. We have... A lot of prayer requests that we're going to pray for tonight. Big welcome, by the way. If you're new to church, it's great to have you here with us. Those that are visiting, um, here's some great stories, some thankful people, some praise reports. People thanking God for the car park team. Yeah, people just thanking God that they're saved. People thanking God for jobs. Someone has been set free from alcohol and drugs. Wow. Someone's just thanking God for money to pay rent. We're uh, thanking God for restoration, financial breakthrough, uh, safe holidays, healing in the knee, cancelled surgery, people at the youth desk. Someone got blessed with a gift of a car. That's pretty awesome. Provision for second semester at college. And so it just goes on and on and on. Okay, we're going to pray. You ready to pray? For a whole lot of situations this very first one here the heading up the top here says we're praying for an old man who got injured during soccer that was sam demoro and he actually did get injured pretty badly today he was playing in the over 45s team and something happened um he's actually broken his leg he rang me as he just got off the field i was on my way to the church to the five o'clock and he said, I don't know what's wrong. I'm on my way to hospital to get an MRI. And we just got a text message. He's uh, broken his tibia. So we need to pray for Sam. <laughs> He's not in a good way. <laughs> but we're going to pray for him, aren't we? Yep. We're going to pray for him. Um, there's all kinds of things. There's lots of them up there on the screen. They're going to keep scrolling through. Can you stretch your hand out? Stretch your hand out towards all these. Come on, let's lift our voice in prayer tonight. Father, we thank you for the all-powerful name of Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask now, God, that you'd heal people. We'd ask to bring comfort to people. That family that have lost a loved one in that accident, Lord, you bring comfort to them. Lord, you bring provision and blessing and favor into people's lives. Did you bring just great mending to families. And Lord, we pray for Pastor Sam tomorrow right now. Lord, we ask that you would your presence would be strong. We ask for a miracle, a miracle in his body right now, that you'd heal him. Father, miraculous power in that hospital bedroom. Right now we ask in Jesus' name. And everybody said together, Amen. Wonderful. Well, it's great to have you in church tonight. Good to have you along. Lots of kids here. All the kids are going to have to head off to Hillsong Kids. You can run out through the footy tunnels. Max and Melody are waiting for you. And everyone else, why don't you turn around and say hi. Try and get to your seats. Okay, how are we going finding our seats? We said to you this morning that we wanted to give a gift to all the girls who 
attended Colour Conference these last two weeks. And Pastor Brian was quite gracious. He said, actually, we'll probably give one to all the girls that didn't go but wanted to go. And then he said, we'll, gi we'll give a gift to all the girls that didn't even register. And then he said, then we'll give a gift to all the girls that don't even know what color means. <laughs> we'll give one to you as well. So I've got them right here. I've got them. And the reason we're doing this, okay, the, the reason we're doing this is because this weekend, tonight, is the end of the pre-registration for Colour Conference. Okay, you can register all year, but the best time to register is right now. And we always extend it right through to now for our church. It finished last week around the world, but for our church, we're giving you a chance, because I don't know if you remember coming into Colour Conference this year. We had two conferences, and they were already sold out before we got to conference. In fact, there was a waiting list for this year's conference two weeks ago. There was a waiting list of over 2,000 women. So because next year things have changed and we can't use the building downtown, we're having four color conferences here hosted in this building, in the Hills campus. Four! Well, the girls have been going crazy registering, so already, right, so many people registering for color conference next year. It's a year away, and you've really only got two options left. You've still got two options, two options. So the reason we're telling you about it is so that tonight you actually do get motivated and get, let's get active and let's register. Because there's one less distraction next year because you've already registered, okay? So girls, what are you gonna do? Register for Color Conference in one of those last two options. And what we're gonna give to all the girls is Magnum ice creams. I know, right? These are limited edition, limited edition. So there are creme brulee ones, meringue ones, all kinds of fruity tooty ones. And they're all like kisses, like first kiss, stolen kiss, loving kiss, all kinds. So I need to give these, I need to give these to some girls and you can eat them right now. You can, you can eat that right now, okay? That's, you can eat that now. And we're gonna give them out to you at the end of the service. There you go. And one up, one up here. Can you catch that one? We're gonna give them out to you at the end of the service. Now listen. If you decide for whatever reason tonight, just to kind of skip out a few minutes early, these won't even be on the door until the end of church. So don't you be walking out going, oh, I just need my Magnum. They'll be going, what Magnum? What Magnum? Magnums don't even appear until the end of the service. Just a, just a hint, just a hint. Here we go. Here we go. One. There you go. So how cool is that? Who wishes they were a girl right now? Harry wants to put a skirt on just so he can have a magnum. I know he'd do it. I know he would. I know he would. Okay, we're going to receive our giving tonight, our tithes and offerings. I want you to welcome Grant Thompson as he comes up to share with us. Thanks, Tomo. We're going to uh, receive our giving, as Joel said, so if you want to begin to prepare to do that, you can. Uh, all the details are on or under uh, on the envelope, which is on or under every seat, and I think also up here on the screens, you can give uh, electronically. That's how that's how we give. Uh, you can uh, via BPay or uh, just using the envelope if you want to. Or we still receive checks. Checks still exist for some people, I think. So uh, while you're preparing, I just want to um, share a thought with you out of the book of Genesis, chapter 28. We pick up here in the narrative where Jacob has had a God encounter, and uh, he has a dream, it says, the scripture says where um, he sees basically a stairway to heaven and angels coming up and coming down and God reveals himself to Jacob and uh, picks up here and says, when Jacob awo awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place and I was not aware of it. He was afraid. And he said, how awesome is this place? This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. Early next morning, Jacob took the stone he had placed under his head and set it up as a pillar and pulled oil on it. He called that place Bethel, though the city used to be called Luz. Then Jacob made a vow saying, if God be with me and will watch over me on this journey, I am taking and will give me food to eat and clothes to wear so that I will safely return to my father's household. Then the Lord will be my God and this stone that I have set up as a pillar will be God's house and of all that you give me, I will give you a tenth. So we see here that Jacob had a God encounter. He, he, something changed in his life. And three things happened. The first thing was that he changed his confession. He changed his worldview. He changed how he saw himself. The second thing was he made a commitment to build a pillar, an anointed place 
of worship, which we would see as the house of God today. And the third thing was, he made a commitment that he was going to take some of what was his finances and he was going to honor God with it. When it comes to honoring God and putting Him first, can I encourage you that putting God first is an act of worship, it's an act of lordship, and it's an act of trust. And every person here, it doesn't matter how long you've been following Jesus, it doesn't matter how long you've been part of this church, I want to encourage you to keep growing in the area of putting God first, trusting Him, trusting His Lordship, and, he, and using this as an act of your worship and trusting that God's promise will prevail over your life. So if you have your giving there, I want to pray over every giver here in Jesus' name. Lord, I thank you, Father, for faithful people who love you, people who have had a revelation of who you are, a revelation of your house, a revelation that everything that we have doesn't actually belong to us. And Lord, we want to honor you with our first fruits. We want to honor you with our substance. We want to put you first. And I pray your blessing over every giver here in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, just as the, uh, the hosts pass the containers down the rows, let's look at the screens. We have a great testimony of one of our new songs from Hillsong United. Before we knew what the album was going to be called, before we knew uh, really what it was going to be about, all I, all I knew was that I felt like we had to, as a foundation, start with the Beatitudes. And, you know, I love the idea that Jesus and his disciples, they climbed up a mountain and uh, Jesus decided to start talking about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, you know, we live in a culture now much in this, the same way as back then you know you've got people just across the spectrum of society because it's human nature wanting to do whatever they can to elevate themselves because they think that there's happiness found in that or there's purpose or meaning found or there's satisfaction found in being on top even in church as christians we think if only if i was a better person if only i was you know a pastor or a leader or a worship leader or if i had talent or gifts or abilities then maybe like that's when god would accept me but it's the opposite god says no, no it doesn't matter who you are because of that, we don't have to try and elevate ourselves to find God. We find God from a position of surrender. I just love the song because it's basically a song of surrender. And I think for me personally, my favorite line in the song is, I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. I really relate to that because it's, it basically says my journey with God in the last few years, just to be in that place of utter surrender and um, just letting everything go and just God's completely in control. In the world's view, surrender would be seen as like uh, maybe a, a sign of weakness or defeat, but it's the opposite. Yeah. Like we surrender not because we've lost, but we surrender because he's already won everything yeah. for us. That's where the kingdom of heaven begins. Ultimately what it's about, I touch the sky when my knees hit the ground. On iTunes. I hope you've got yours downloaded already. I'm loving it, absolutely loving it. Hit it on repeat the whole time. Kilo of Kindness is something that our church, if you've been in our church for a while, you'd be quite familiar with. And it is just taking one of these bags home and filling it up with non-perishable food items. And then you bring it back in, drop it off, and we're able to help get these things to literally thousands of families and people that are in need. And what I love about this is that song that they were just talking about, Joel and Taya, that I've reached the, I touch, I've reached the sky, the, the stars, when my knees hit the ground. And Pastor Brian was talking last weekend about that whole song, Touch the Sky. And he was talking about how it's so easy to have a, want to have a dream and you want to reach for the stars, but we lose sight of the ground. And that keeps us in focus with the ground. Kilo of Kindness helps keep our feet on the ground to realize that no matter how, how blessed we are, how fortunate we are, how lucky we are, how healthy we are, there's always someone near us or around us that's doing it tough. And so we take these bags home tonight, bring them back to Easter next weekend, and let's believe for thousands and thousands and thousands of items to come in where we can have a huge impact. Just local community, people. If you've got friends and family, if you know people who are doing it tough, let us know so that we can help distribute to them okay that'd be great here's easter here's what's going on grab your easter brochure it'll tell you everything you need to know about easter it's going to explain a bit of the global campaign that's happening cross equals love right around the world all of our churches are doing it 
everywhere and you can see the different things that they are doing. If you get to the middle of this, it'll help you see what you can do, how you can play your part. You've got the invite cards there, that you've got four little invite cards that you can rip into the little squares. You can, that, that, that will help you. Put that in my back pocket for later. And you've got the armbands that you can wear. These are starting amazing conversations. People just say, what's that you got in your hand? And you can talk to them about cross equals love. We're going to have planes going across in the sky next weekend with the big banners behind them. Everything is designed to create conversation. That's what we're doing. And so use the hashtag, use the Hillsong app, take photos, stamp the cross equals love on it, use the hashtag. Let's make sure that we're quite prolific this week getting everything out because it starts the conversation so that next weekend people like Easter, cross equals love, oh, that's that thing happening at church. Let's see if we can get people there. Here's the last thing I want to tell you about, the prayer card that we asked you this morning to bring back tonight, all right? I'm hoping that you've got that on you and you've already put some names on it. We're going to pray for these people in just a moment. So if you haven't done that already, if you didn't know about that this morning, grab your prayer card on the back, write down some names, some family, some friends, people in your neighborhood, because we're going to pray over all of these names and agree together that somehow God's love would reach people. doesn't matter where people are at in life, every human needs Jesus. Every human. And so we're going to pray for those lives together, okay? So write that in, and then we're going to hold them up in just a moment, and we're going to pray for them. Why don't you have a look at the screens one more time and check out Church News. The story of our sisterhood is this gorgeous tapestry of lives interwoven. Commit to the path, don't fear the road, and don't draw back from it. As followers of Jesus Christ, you have permission to rise up and be who God has called you to be. Stay the path. Ah, uh, it's so great, hey? I want you to, wonder if you could stand with us tonight, right across all our campuses. If you haven't yet, you might want to take one of these with you, take it home, but hopefully you've written some names down on these prayer cards, okay? So why don't everyone grab your card? I've got names on mine, and be thinking about, these are, these are people, all right? These are names. Big welcome to all the other campuses there in, in the city, Alexandria, up there in Brisbane as well. We're praying for all of these names, these families, these friends of ours, people in our life. This is not a hit list. It's not a sales list. It's a love list. It, we, we, we understand as Christians that the whole world should know Jesus. We understand that implicitly. 
And so this is a list because of our love and our genuine care for people that we're taking time to write them down and say, God, please, would, would you do something this week? Would you, would you intervene? Would you give us spiritual conversations? If not us, could leave somebody to them, to have conversations with them. And who knows that somehow we might not see many of these names at Easter with us next week and across all our campuses. Togsy, where are you, buddy? Come up and pray for all these names. Why don't you hold your card up? Hold it up in the air. Come on, church, hold them up. We're going to pray for all these names together. Jesus. Father, we just thank you so much for the, the gift of salvation, God, that is available to every human on this earth. And Lord, we just commit this week to you, Father. Lord, in our conversations, Holy Spirit, would you be upon them? Lord, would you help us, God? Would you soften hearts? And Lord, we thank you that salvation is on this house, God, and we will see salvations, God, pour in, God, this weekend, in the coming weekends, God. Lord, we just believe for our families, our friends, Lord, our children, our households, Lord, our school friends, Lord, our work friends, Lord, anyone we come into contact with, may they truly know cross equals love. We commit it to you in the name of Jesus. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, all campuses, let's worship the Lord together. Come on. personal nature of God. Oh Lord, oh Lord, our God, not just a far away God. Lord, you are the God, but you're also our God. Lord, I thank you today that you have a heart for every person who's gathered here, every person watching through live stream, those on our other campuses, those, Father, who are tuned in through their television screens. And I thank you in Jesus' name. You have a purpose and you have a plan for every single person's life. We say, Lord, have your way in the hearts of your people. Fulfill your word. Fulfill your promise in the hearts of your people. Even tonight, may this word speak life into people. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Our God, we need a bit of Sunday night spirit in the place. Amen. We need a bit of Holy Ghost spirit in this place. I just feel in all our campuses, we're linked with uh, Alexandria, we're linked with Mount Cravat in Brisbane, and I think we should sing one more time the trampoline verse. I love that verse, the trampoline verse. And then we're going to praise the Lord, not just with beautiful voices, but with our voice, with our bodies, with our hearts, with our spirit. Come on, let's get praising God together. Amen.
If you need a touch of God in your life, if you need healing in your body, if maybe you've just been getting attacked with sickness, there's people tonight, this time of year, and your family, your kids and your family are at home because of colds and flu and sickness. And I know Cass, who's a very important part of our team, she's been struggling and fighting with pneumonia. So the stuff goes on and stuff goes around after color conference. Immune systems are down. I'm not a doctor, but I do know that oftentimes that's where people try to get sick. I'm believing that sickness is going to be minimized across the life of our church this coming autumn and winter time. Come on, everywhere you are, if you believe for healing, if you need healing in your body, if your family needs healing, your kids or your wife or your husband, your parents even, lift your hand. We're going to pray. Father, I thank you that you are our healer. You are the Lord that heals us. It's through your strength through the finished work of Jesus Christ. It's through your suffering that healing is our portion. Lord, you gave your life down so that we may have life. And I thank you in Jesus' name that every sickness and disease, every ache and pain is subject to the name of all names. Lord, I say have your way in the hearts and lives of people. Fulfill your word, Father. Lord, we believe for life. We believe for newness of life. We believe for complete health and healing. We claim it by faith in Jesus. Jesus name. We thank you for the power of your word, Lord Jesus. In Jesus That's a powerful, powerful song. I love it when a new song brings such fresh life into the life of our church. So praise God for it. The greatest treasure in our church is the people of our church. So grateful for each and every one of you for your loyalty and your faithfulness and your commitment. And, you know, we're praying for our friends and our family and colleagues at Easter. Let's really believe this Easter our own lives will get greatly impacted by the message of Jesus, that God will do something very significant in our own lives this Easter time. Well, right next door, five o'clock service, we've been having a series called Financial Fitness. And I'll tell you, it's interesting because obviously a lot of people really are believing uh, to find their way into health and fitness and their finances because it kind of doubled the crowd in their five o'clock service, in fact, tripled it in some of the services and more. And so it shows that people have a hunger but you, I already preached. This will be my sixth time in 24 hours. And I actually preached three different messages so far. So I want to talk in this message about the same thing, leaving Struggle Street. Leaving Struggle Street. Do you ever relate to the seven dwarfs? I owe, I owe. It's off to work I go. I oh, I oh, I oh, I oh. It's amazing how we can always be living our lives battling and struggling and never getting the breakthrough. And maybe it's kind of what you inherited from your parents and then from their parents. And we've always been blue collar. We've always been working class. And I tell you, God's not into class. God's just a lover of people. People of all walks of life and people from the faceless to the famous. And so it's not a matter of class, but it is a matter of being released into all that God called you to do. I don't believe that God saved you to frustrate you. He saved you to bless you. And I believe to see that blessing in every area of your life, spiritually, in your spiritual life, in your soul, your inner well-being, and in your physical well-being as well. And I don't believe it's the will of God for anyone to go through life battling and struggling and never getting ahead and feeling like you can't provide properly for your children. I believe God genuinely wants to bless people. And maybe you're a person who really genuinely tries to put God first. You tithe, you honor God with your finances, you try very hard to do the right thing, and yet you still feel like 
you're struggling. Why would that be when there's such promise for those who honor God with their finances? Why would it be? Is it possible that maybe we're doing the right thing with one hand, but what we're doing on the one hand through lack of knowledge or lack of understanding or lack of wisdom, we're seeing it pulled down again with the other hand? If you'd ask someone what's their greatest lack, and I'm talking specifically tonight uh, about finances, but maybe you think, well, my biggest lack is people, people who will just stand with me, or maybe it's investors, or cash flow, or capital, or maybe it's collateral, maybe in actual fact you just lack opportunity, maybe you even lack a job, but can I tell you, none of those things are your biggest lack tonight. Your greatest lack often is wisdom. Do you have money problems, or do you have wisdom problems? A lot of people, maybe they feel like they have leadership lacks, but I think often it's wisdom lacks. People have, is it a marriage problem or is it simply a wisdom problem? Godly wisdom in the relationship could mean that maybe all those problems would go away. Never underestimate the importance of wisdom. In James chapter 1 verse 5, I've been speaking from the book of James. In James chapter 1 verse 5, it tells us where to go if we lack wisdom. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally and without reproach. That word reproach means fault finding. In other words, if you ask God, he's not going to come pointing the finger and pointing out why you're in the mess you're in and why you're always struggling. He's not going to find fault. No, he gives generously and without reproach. He's not going to point the finger. He gives to those, the scripture says, it will be given to them. It will be given to you. So asking of God is such a good thing. I want to live my life with godly wisdom. Perhaps we would need less miracles if we had more wisdom. And I'm not undermining miracles because I'm a great believer in the supernatural and a great believer in the power of God to work miraculously. But we're often praying for miracles and maybe we should just ask like the Bible does for godly wisdom. After all, we're taught that wisdom is the number one thing. The Bible says wisdom is the principal thing. James chapter 4 verse 7 says, Wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all you're getting, get understanding. Well, a lot of people, they're chasing riches. They want to get rich. Other people, and I'm talking in a financial sense here, they want to get lucky. They're hoping to win the lottery. They're hoping, uh, uh, finances. They, uh, they're hoping to win the lottery. They're hoping that maybe they had a rich old grandmother they didn't know they had. They're believing that somehow luck will come their way. You can try to get rich. You can try to, you know, get all sorts of other things. You can try to get material things. But the Bible says that all you're getting should be pulled into one thing. Get wisdom with all you're getting. Get understanding. If we trust God for godly wisdom and godly understanding, it's incredible how that can bring the blessing and promise of God into our lives. It's not God's will for you to live your entire life on Struggle Street. He wants you to leave Struggle Street and live where your life means that you can have the resource to do all that he's put in your heart to do. I have no doubt about it whatsoever. No doubt about it whatsoever. Listen to this, Proverbs 2 verse 6. You think success is just a a secular thing. It's got nothing to do with the word of God. Look at it right there, the new King James version of the Bible. It says, Proverbs 2 verse 6, for the Lord gives wisdom from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He holds success in store. For the upright, he is a shield to those who walk is blameless, whose walk is blameless. He holds success in store. And the Bible puts wisdom and success in the same thought. Don't ever feel it's not God's will for you to be successful. We may define success a different way than some other people because success is not just about things and stuff and money. It's not even just about fame and fortune. You may define success as different, but just like in the times of Joshua, where the scripture says, you will make your way prosperous and you will have good success. Here in Solomon's wisdom, it talks again, if I can read that scripture one more time, Proverbs 2 verse 6. Listen to what it says one more time. It says, for the Lord gives wisdom, and it goes on and says he has success in store. And so 
I wonder what you're believing for in life. You know, oh, that's not God's will. I, I don't believe that's God's will for my life at all. All I need is a car that can get me from A to B, which is fine if it was only about you. But what if God wanted to take you to C, D, E, F, or G, and you've only got a car that could get you from A to B? All I need is enough food for my table. It sounds very noble. It sounds very spiritual. I had a lady say that to me once. I don't need much. All I need is enough food for my table. But I'm praying that we can put food on a whole lot of other people's table. I'm believing that you can understand with the right heart and the right spirit and with godly wisdom that God can bring blessing and power and promise into your life and into your world. So it may sound spiritual, but it often is simply an excuse for living your life selfish and small rather than believing to be resourced to do what God's called you to do. So, Wisdom is so important. In this book of James, where it says, if anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives generously. It's like a patchwork. In other words, it's a letter to all of the Jewish believers of the time, but it's not just kind of a unnatural, you know, a theme that just runs beautifully chronologically through. It's actually a whole lot of patchwork of things, but you look at that patchwork in the few first few verses, and it gives us a good indication on why James challenged us about our allegiance by calling himself a bondservant, but of why he says, counted it of all joy when you encounter various trials, of why he goes on from there and talks about wisdom, then jumps straight into double-mindedness and wavering, and he that wavers being like the wave of the sea, and why from there he goes on and talks about the, the as the sun sh- shines and the flower of the field fades, so a rich man will fade in his pursuit, then he goes on from there and swings it to temptation and says, uh, blessed is the man who will endure temptation for when he is a tried or when he is approved, he'll receive the crown of life. And then he goes from there into gifts and talents and the father of lights. And it says every good gift and, per-. and then he swings it here to be slow to speak and quick to hear. And then he goes from there and talks about the need of the implanted word. Well, I'll tell you something. I'll tell you something that's really important. And that is the blessing of God only ever, only ever, in fact, just successful stop from any, any source. It only ever, ever increases or heightens some of those things that can trip us up, that can hold us back. Our weaknesses and our vulnerabilities are only ever heightened by success. So let's take it for a moment and look at some of the things James spoke about. He started James a bond servant. He called himself a slave. He literally positioned himself there. He could have said, I'm Jesus' brother. He could have said, I'm the pastor of the church in Jerusalem. He could have said, I'm a pillar in the church. He could have gone to the fact that he had influence over all of the 12 tribes globally. He had global influence, but he didn't. He called himself a bond servant. He didn't live by his bloodline. He lived by his allegiance. Well, listen to it. Have a look there. James chapter 1. Uh, verse 1, there's the scripture. And I'll tell you something right now. When success comes into a person's life, it's incredible how that allegiance will be tested. And this is the whole thing. This is where you need godly wisdom. Because people, they wonder why they don't see the breakthrough. But God wants to be able to trust you with success. He wants to be able to trust you with blessing and with fruitfulness. And so it will only ever heighten. Because there'll already be people looking at you and saying, oh, wow, look at you. How have you done it? Come and do a seminar. And it's incredible how self-sufficiency quickly creeps in. And when we're successful, we can become idealistic about a whole lot of things. And we can make it all about ourselves. And that's why sometimes we need the kind of godly wisdom to understand that our allegiance never changes. No matter where we are in life and on our journey, if we make it about anything else except for our servitude heart towards Jesus Christ, we're already an explosion or implosion waiting to happen. He goes on, like I say, and he talks about trials, counted all trials. I spoke about that this morning. When you encounter all sorts of troubles, knowing that the testing of your faith works patience. Well, if you think when you get successful and blessed that all your troubles are going to go away, I've got some news for you. The higher the tree, the more the wind blows. Greater levels, bigger devils. You know, are they talking in Australia about the tall poppy, how people want to knock the tall poppy down? 
you start getting successful, you are the tall poppy. Opposition is coming your way, whether you like it or not. All of a sudden, for whatever reason, there's going to be things and people that are going to get riled up. There's going to be all sorts of things that come your way. And that's why we need to learn in the test and we need to count it joy in the trials because God is testing us. He wants us to live our lives approved because, listen to it, it's all about being perfect, complete and lacking nothing. Perfect means mature. Children do silly things. Someone who is successful, who hasn't learned to be seasoned and mature, will end up self-imploding because they'll do silly things. That's why the scripture says that trials are about giving us the kind of endurance to live in maturity. And then it goes on and says that you may be complete. It means sound, well, and whole. Because again, many people, they, they implode with success. Drug addiction. Commit suicide. Sometimes simply have a drug overdose and they're only young. But it seemed all life came to them, but they weren't well, they weren't whole. We're sometimes, we want the breakthrough, but let's have the wisdom to learn so that we, when blessing comes, we keep our sufficiency in Christ. We make it about Him. We understand that the trials will only ever get bigger. They'll only ever get greater. Oh, I loved one thing about being a little church. No one cared about us. All of a sudden, when we rose up above the radar, everyone seemed to care about us and everyone has an opinion. Well, it's all right for you. You only come here. It's actually not. And I've got to tell you, a whole lot of things have, a whole lot of things have got a whole lot better for Hillsong Church, which is wonderful. It's great. But I'd also have to say, it's part of the price you pay. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't swap it for anything. It's just part of the price you pay. Well, he goes on then and talks about being double-minded in verses uh, 6 to 8. Listen to it. Let him ask in faith with no doubting. Talking about wisdom. Ask in faith without doubting. He who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. Let not that man suppose he'll receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, here's the point. When our church was small, it was easy to do radical things. There's only a few of us. That only affected a few people. It's much harder to turn a big ship than a jet ski. You can throw someone off the back of a jet ski and it's just fun, but you try throwing a few people off a cruise ship, you're going to be in a lot of trouble. <laughs> and so here's some of the reasons why we wonder, well, why am I going to break through? But we need the godly wisdom so we know where our allegiance is so that when the trials and the opposition comes that we have the courage and the guts and the season enough to stand firm and not to be ruled by the things that would try to knock you off course. Then it goes on, same verses, and it talks about a rich man's pursuits. Verse 11, right at the end of the verse, it says the rich man will fade away in his pursuits. It really is talking about the fact that, you know, ultimately a rich man is going to pass away just like everybody else. But I don't think the problem is his riches. The Bible never in one place says you can't be rich. But more important than whether or not you have riches is whether or not you have the right heart toward riches. Because otherwise riches have you and they make a terrible master. A terrible master. They'll destroy your life and ruin you as quick as anything, eat you up and eat up your marriage, and eat up the world around and about you as well. And so the rich man fades in his pursuits. I believe the issue is actually his pursuits. And again, when blessing starts coming your way, suddenly a lot of those pursuits are more accessible. You have the money to pursue different things. All of a sudden, everyone wants to know you. Some of those pursuits become a whole lot more accessible suddenly. It goes on then and talks about temptation. Blessed is a man who endures temptations. Well, I would say again that all blessing does is it will cause the temptations to be intensified. Years and years ago, there was... An NRL, uh, an NRL rugby league player became a Christian in our church. This is a long time ago. He's, he's long retired now. But he got saved and he used to say to me, Brian, there's a lot of sin in rugby league. There's a lot of sin in rugby league. It's, a lot of, it's like we're thinking, really? Well, no one knew that, you know. There's a lot of sin in rugby league. But you know, it's crazy. It's really crazy. These guys, I mean, it's amazing how women literally will, 
excuse me for saying so, but cheapen themselves and just throw themselves at people. It's amazing how so many temptations become accessible to young people who have money and who have fame and perhaps on top of that have a great big muscular body, whether it's in that area or whether it's in a whole lot of other areas. And that's why we need to be able to be proven. You want to be blessed? You want to move off Struggle Street? I wonder if you would pass the test. Would, you, would your allegiance to stand or would you suddenly become self-sufficient? I wonder if when the trials come and the opposition comes because you want what someone has but you often don't want what they've had to go through to get there. I wonder if at the end of the day when it comes to making the big decisions they get harder because the costs are higher and it's much more difficult sometimes to be decisive knowing there's a lot more lives at stake. There's a whole lot more to risk. And so on and on I could go. James then speaks about the source of our gifts. He says every good gift and every perfect gift comes from the Father of lights, come from God above. How quickly do we make it about my gift? Well, it's my gift. And if I think these are my gifts and talents, then I can do with them whatever I want. I can just do whatever I want. But God gave you those gifts and talents. Every good gift and every perfect gift. And God is not schizophrenic. He doesn't make you one way to use you a different way. And people want to use their gifts to go off and just chase their own thing. But if we understand our gifts and talents are from God, and when all of a sudden God starts uh, literally using your gift, uses your talent, and you find yourself out there in the forefront. Will you remember from whence you came? Will you remember? I can see why sometimes God wants to not keep you struggling, but doesn't necessarily automatically just throw a whole lot of success people's way because I don't think many people will handle it. But you can if you live according to God's word. Finally, in verse 21, here it talks about the implanted word. It talks about the implanted word which is able to save your soul. And you know, here's the thing. When, you, when you're desperate, it's amazing how you need the word of God. It's amazing how when all of a sudden you're in a mess and you're desperate, you'll go to God's word, you'll go straight to the Psalms or the Proverbs. Whatever you do, don't go to Lamentations or Leviticus or, you know... <laughs> <laughs> go, go to the Psalms and the Proverbs and you, you'll find something and all of it feeds you. It, it, it's, it's so tragic when people, rather than having the Word implanted in them, are so easily removed because suddenly they become sloppy in the Word. Suddenly the foundations of their faith are not quite so important. And so, friend, it's the will of God to bless you. But it's our, it's our place to seek wisdom to make wisdom the principal thing with all our getting to get wisdom so that we have the wisdom to sustain the blessing. We have the wisdom to live in the promise and the power and the purpose of God. Yes, you want this. Yes, you want that. But ask yourself the question, do I really want what it takes? Do I have the wherewithal when the opposition comes, when the temptation comes, when all those pursuits are accessible to me? Do I have the wherewithal to hold my course? Because tragedy I've seen how God blesses people's gifts and suddenly rather than that be something that they've used for the glory of God, it's led them away on pursuits where sadly they have lost their way spiritually and it can end up cost people their lives, their health, their marriages, their families, their children, all sorts of things. God wants to be able to trust you. He wants to be able to trust you. And I pray I can live my life in a way like Solomon that keeps the main thing the main thing. Second Chronicles chapter 1, God said to Solomon, hey, it's in the night time. And in verse 7, listen to what God says. On that night, God appeared to Solomon and he said to him, ask, what shall I give you? God's saying to Solomon, you can have anything. Ask whatever you want. And you know what? Solomon said, I just want wisdom. I want wisdom to lead and to judge your people. This is what God said. God says, well, you didn't ask for riches. You didn't ask for wealth. You didn't ask for honor. You didn't ask for the life of your enemies. I mean, that would have been a good one if I had a thought of it. You know, I said, kill him. Not you, by the way. I'm not talking to anyone over here. <laughs> I promise I'm not talking about you. No, no. And he says, you didn't even ask for long life. You asked for wisdom. Look at verse 12. Second Chronicles chapter 1, then God said to Solomon, Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you 
And you have not asked riches or wealth or honor or the life of your enemies, nor have you asked long life, but have asked wisdom and knowledge for yourself that you may judge my people over whom I made you king. Verse 12, have we got it there? Listen to it. Wisdom and knowledge are granted to you, and I will give you riches and wealth and honor, such as none of the kings have had who were before you, nor shall any after you have the like. The principal thing is wisdom. Godly wisdom builds the house. Proverbs 9 verse 1. Godly wisdom builds the house. Godly wisdom doesn't build on sand. Poor foundation, it builds on the rock. The rock, he's our foundation. His name is Jesus. When you are building on a rock, I believe, my heart as a pastor is to want to see people blessed. Do you know the greatest thing you can say to me when it comes to fulfillment? Like some of the business people sometimes say, they say, really, in our business, all we've done is taken the principles we learned at church and applied them to our business. To me, that is the greatest thing you can say because that's what wires me. I want to see people do well. I want to see people bless. I love it when young people get their first home. I love it. I just get such a buzz out of it. I love when I see people starting to get ahead in life because to me, I see people seeing the Word of God working in their life. But let's prove that we are trustworthy so that having done all, We will still stand, still stand, mature, well and whole and sound and lacking nothing. Then you can stand in the promise and promise of God. You're going to need maturity to be ready. You're going to need to muscle up on your weaknesses, be complete to be ready. You're going to need to strengthen your lacks. You're going to need to resist temptation. You're going to need to remember the source of your gift. You're going to have to stay close to the implanted Word of God. Do you know an engrafted tree, that word is engrafted in other translations. Literally, it's where two trees are engrafted together. And a horticulturalist can do that. Do you know something? The engrafted Word means it actually becomes part of us. Once it's part of you, that's what will flow out of you. So whether it's difficulty or success, whether it's trial or whether it's a season of great blessing, it's not going to knock you off course. You're going to hold your course. That's what I want to see for you. That's what I'm going to see for people, younger people. That's what I believe for you. But ask yourself the question, how easily could, you, could a few friends with the wrong temptations easily get you off course? God wants to be able to trust you. He wants to be able to trust you with his word, with his power, with his promise. Here's some keys, I believe, to financial fitness. And the first one is simply right believing. Right believing. Right believing about God's will for you to bless you. Do you know something? People are so quick to reduce the blessing of God that was something for his Old Testament people and something for heaven. Somehow we got missed out. We got suspended in the gap. God wants to bless you, wants to crown with you life, but it's in eternity. It's in the afterlife. Or God blessed Abraham, the Abrahamic blessing on his Old Testament people. There was a whole lot of blessing there. Success belonged in the Old Testament. Prosperity belonged in the Old Testament. You know, it's sad that in church, you can use the word blessed, you can use the word uh, fruitful, but you can't use the word prosperity. They actually mean the same thing. And prosperity is help for the journey. Prosperity is provision for the vision. Prosperity is not a pile of money necessarily. Prosperity can be spirit, soul, and body. It's all about God's blessing in your life. There is no such thing as a prosperity gospel. Generally, the people who talk about a prosperity gospel are people who have an issue with money. They're the ones who say, oh, it's a prosperity gospel. There is only one gospel. That is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. There is only one gospel. But it is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel of grace. It is a gospel of favor. It is a gospel of blessing. So let's get right believing. And don't allow someone else's small-minded religious, Jesus is the narrow way, but he's not tight. Not restricting. He wants you to live a big life through a narrow gate, the name of Jesus, into a glorious future. Right believing is so important. Much more important than having money is having a right heart toward money. 
And you know, if you want right believing towards money, number one, you can't love it. The Bible never ever says money is the root of evil. It says the love of money. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 10. Listen to it. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Man, I tell you, the love of money is such a big deal. It says, for which some have strayed from the faith. Sadly, I've seen that. People just, just basically loving money. Love money, as I said, it makes a horrible, horrible master. But they stray from the faith and pierce themselves through with many sorrows. How many marriages have been destroyed through the love of money? Money's too big and too important in the house. How many, how many futures have been destroyed through the love of money? Well, here's something else. You may presume that people who love money are people who have money. That may or may not be true. Sometimes people who love money are the people who don't have money and are completely ruled by what other people do have. They get angry about success in somebody else's life. They get angry about the blessing. That's a good sign. Maybe, maybe if they're receiving the offering in church and you're thinking, oh, he's going on and on. Here they go again. They're about money. I just wonder, I just wonder. Maybe I'm not judging you. I'm just wondering. <laughs> I'm just wondering whether the love of the money is the issue here. In our house, we don't talk about religion. We don't talk about politics. We don't talk about money. Why? Is it ruling you? How wonderful to get free. How wonderful to be free enough to live so that you are free. It's not ruling you. You don't love money. It doesn't rule you. And if God can trust you with money because you don't love it, then I believe that money can have a great, great impact through your hand. Money. Is not bad. Money is not evil. All money does is reflect what's already in a person's character. If a person is a person who's of poor character, then their money's going to reflect it. If a person is a person who already they're filled with greed, then their money is going to reflect it. If they're selfish, their money. But you put money in the hand of a righteous man, and it can be a great tool for the kingdom and a great tool for the purpose of God. Money is innate it's just money it stinks, it's dirty but don't love it you can't love it and you can't trust it oh what a mistake to put your trust in money 1 Timothy 6.17 goes on says command those who are rich in this present age not to be haughty, not to trust not to trust in uncertain riches what a sad thing when people put all their trust in money the global financial crisis showed what a danger that is. There's a whole lot of uncertainty to riches. Do not trust in uncertain riches, but trust in who? The living God who gives richly all things. What does all things mean? All spiritual things? All things means all things. Who gives richly all things, all things to enjoy. That's the word of God. It's not Brian Houston. It's the word of God. Don't put your trust in money. It's uncertain. Put your trust in God, the living God, who gives richly, the living God. He'll breathe life into your wallet. He'll breathe life into your economy. He'll breathe life into your budget. He'll breathe life into your finances. If you keep your trust in God and don't put your trust in money, you can't love it, you can't trust it, you can't serve it. You can't serve two masters. If you think you can serve money and things and Jesus at the same time, you cannot do it. Luke 16, verse 11, Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, do you know there was a God of mammon? Literally a God of material things. And so basically it's saying you can't serve the God of mammon who will commit to your truth, trust the true riches. The Bible says you can't serve God and money. It says you can't serve two masters. You can't love it. You don't want to trust it. You certainly don't want to serve it. Well, what a beautiful servant it is, though, in the hands of a person who's got a kingdom spirit. And then the final thing is, you can't chase it. People spend their life chasing money. The rich man will fade away in his pursuit. And I'll tell you, it'll prove itself incredibly elusive if you spend your life chasing money. Pursue Christ. Pursue the Holy Spirit. Pursue the things of God. Seek first the kingdom of God. And you watch how God can bring His promise and His power and His blessing into your life. Let's keep the main thing the main thing. And you keep the main thing and the main thing. And you won't be chasing money, but blessing will be chasing you down. Blessing will overtake you. Amen. It will overtake you. 
blessing will chase you down. When Bobby and I got married, I've spoken many times about this. The way we talked, as we talked about our lives together serving Jesus, we genuinely believed we may never own our own house, and it was okay. It was okay. I genuinely believed that, like all my young friends were maybe saving up and going, working in Europe for a year, I thought maybe we'd never ever get the chance to leave New Zealand, but we were okay. We just wanted to serve God. And serving God, we've never, I can tell you before God, no matter what any report ever has said, we've never gone chasing things or money or blessing. But I can tell you right now that blessing just keeps chasing us. And I believe blessing can chase you if you just keep the main thing. If you keep the main thing, the main thing. Right believing. Right believing. Second, and you know, this is so important. It's just such a small difference, but such a huge difference. Don't seek riches. Seek, you don't want to live your life wanting to be rich. Live your life wanting to be blessed. And what's the difference? Jesus, through a vision to John on the Isle of Patmos, spoke about the different churches in Revelation. And about one of those churches, I think it was Laodicea. Listen to what he says, Revelation 3 verse 17. You say, I'm rich have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And don't know you're wretched, miserable, poor, and blind, naked. Well, listen, that's the, that's the spirit of, of a rich man. I have need of nothing. I could retire at 45. I have need. In other words, it's all about me. It's all about my table. It's all about my life. It's all about my comfort. I have need of nothing. Blessed has a totally different spirit. Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. God to Abraham, I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. There's a huge difference between wanting to be rich and determining you're committed to being blessed. Because one is about me and my comfort. I have need of nothing. And that's tragic because we turn, bring it all and reduce it all to us. But blessing, I will say that, it's, that I am blessed. I am blessed and I will be a blessing. I want the people of this church to be blessed because I believe God's got a big call on our church and I believe we're called to be a blessing. And I don't want us to be hindered by living on Struggle Street. I believe to see people in our church prosperous. I believe to see you blessed. I believe to see you living in the glory and in the purpose of God, not by loving money, not by serving money, not by chasing money, not by trusting in money, but by believing God for blessing, living so the blessing of God chases you down. It chases you down. <laughs> I'm doing okay for my sixth time this weekend. I've got to say that. I've got to say. Hey. <laughs> Seek blessing. And they have, a different, they have a different purpose. One is all about being a blessing. The other is living comfortable. I have need of nothing. One's about calling. The other's about comfort. But they also have a different spirit. And that's where the dangerous declaration comes in. Because Jesus, he, he said, take a risky path. You've heard it said, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, or whatever else. He says, but I say, and he gave a new way. And he talked about blessing. Blessing come to who? The pure in heart, the merciful, the peacemaker, the poor in spirit to those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, those who are persecuted for my name's sake. In other words, in God's kingdom, the way up is down. It's all about falling upward, upward falling. It's all about upward falling. So, you know, in a way you take a good, big risk because you're seeking first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And then you believe for the promise of God, all these things. And it's Matthew 6, 33. And it's specifically the context is material things. That's what it's talking about. All these things. It's literally talking about food on your table and clothes to wear. All these things shall be added to you in Jesus' name. And so, friend, with a different purpose, with a different spirit and a different process, honoring God and putting Him first in our life, that's where the blessing of God comes from. Man, I see, look, you see this guy here. He's Fijian, he's got a big beard. And uh, well, during color conference, he was out the back doing a menial task out there. I talked to him for a while. I hadn't actually met him before. So we're chatting away. And he's just doing something out there, humbly serving. And literally, literally, he was just doing something that had nothing to do with the platform or being up here. I had no clue that you actually were a bass player. Isn't it amazing that he's standing here 
But oftentimes, what's put him here is a whole lot more to do with what he's doing out there. The way up is down in the kingdom of God. Praise God. The way up is down in God's kingdom. It's a different order. It's a different way. Amen. Well, I've got to give you one more. My time's gone, but I really don't care. I'm going to give you one more. If in Brisbane you need to go, I know up there you've got to get early sleeps and everything. But down here, people are hungry for the word. They want more. They just are hungry. They want more. So I'm only going to give you one more. The cricket's pretty well over. Don't worry about it. Listen to it. I think it's important. It's understanding the balance between perspiration and inspiration. You're not going to get anywhere in life without hard work. You're just not going to do it. I'll tell you right now, and I think anyone who knows us knows it already, Bobby and I have worked very hard from pretty well the day we, we left school. It's amazing. You work hard, stay married, make wise choices. It's amazing how you'll find over 40 years of working and being constant and working hard what God can bring into your life, not just materially. But even in terms of the blessing of this church, it's just been consistency, just been working hard. But let's believe for perspiration. The Bible gives plenty of promise for that. Proverbs 22 verse 29 says, the man who excels in his work. In other words, he's committed to his work. He will stand before kings. He will not stand before unknown men. Where will he stand? God will position him before kings. Sometimes you look at someone's life and say, man, how did they get that opportunity? How did they meet that person? How did that happen? Oftentimes, just because you excelled in your work, and it's amazing how that will open doors for you. You never imagine God. Don't ever judge God in five minutes. Oh, you know, you're young. You just say, well, you know, I believe God and all that, but at the moment, I'm still working down in there at Coles, and I can't even get a job. You live a lifetime of serving Jesus, and you watch what God can do to bring blessing. A little bit of perspiration. If you don't work, you don't eat in Paul's wisdom. Watch the ant, the Bible says. You ever watched ants? They'll make you tired just watching them. They keep themselves so busy. They can lift great big, huge things as they all work in teams. And the Bible says, watch the ant. I don't, I'm not calling you this, but this is what the Bible says. Watch the ant, you slug. That's what it says. Watch the ant, you sluggard. What's the ant? Perspiration and inspiration. See, perspiration's the natural. That's the hard work. Inspiration, that's the supernatural. That's the God idea. You don't have to reinvent the wheel. You don't have to come up with some great big invention. You know, sometimes it's just a point of difference. Just a little thought, something fresh, something new, a little tweak. A little tweak. I'll give you a little simple illustration. A little simple illustration is we started a five o'clock service again. We started in the chapel now at the eight o'clock morning service here at Hills. The chapel service is absolutely packed every Sunday morning with people down the sides. When we started the five, it kind of was, it was good, it was okay, and it kind of got fullish. Uh, sometimes, sometimes not so much. And I just got this little idea at the end of last year, sitting on an airplane, I believe the Holy Spirit spoke to me, about having a series on the demonstration of God's power. Because the scripture talks about the demonstration of God's power. We don't come to you, da -da -da -da, but in a demonstration of God's power. And so we did that. It's a simple little thing, but you know, instantly, it was impossible to fit the people in the hub. In the chapel, we had to move into the hub, a bigger building. And ever since then, we've seen momentum we never have before. Well, coming into this year, I just had a simple, simple little thing. Same thing, a financial fitness series. And you know, that financial fitness series didn't just double the crowd that come. It actually sometimes has tripled and maybe even quadrupled the crowd that was coming because it touched a nerve. And you can say, well, I could think of that. Why didn't you? <laughs> you know what? If you just believe God for inspiration, a little God idea can change so much in your life. Just a little God thought. And our church has never been built, built on great big flashes from the sky revelations. For yea, thus saith the Lord. No, but just little bits of inspiration from the Holy Spirit. Oftentimes sitting on an airplane for a few hours and all of a sudden the meditation starts. And it's incredible what's come out of that meditation. You don't have to be Steve Jobs. No. So, wouldn't be bad, would it? Here's the point. I just heard yesterday 
that the boss of Apple is giving away $800 million of his own fortune. $800 million as part of Bill Gates could challenge to billionaires to give away half their fortune. These are unchurched people who understand the power of blessing. <laughs> Giving away billions of dollars. You say, well, that's easy. They've got billions of dollars. Okay, you don't. But what are you doing with what you do have? Because if you're not faithful a little, you won't be faithful over a much as well. And if unchurched people understand the principles of giving and blessing, how much more of those who understand the source of our blessing, the God of heaven, how much more should we not want to live in blessing so that we can live our lives being a blessing, making a difference? That's what financial fitness looks like in Jesus' name. So I pray that we won't try to be rich people chasing riches like so many people in the world, but as Absolutely live your life so that blessing chases you down and you watch what God can do in your life. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Amen. Come on, Dave Ware. Get up here. A little bit of perspiration, a little bit of inspiration. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Amen. with us a moment. in your life. If you genuinely, you genuinely believe that God's got a purpose for your life and you pray for God's blessing so you can do some of those things He's put in your heart to do. I want to pray for those hearts in Alexandria, here at the hills, and of course, right there in our incredible Brisbane campus. So if that's you, I just want to speak blessing into your life. I want to pray it. I want to, I want to if I can, declare it into your life. Remember in the Old Testament there, Numbers 6, where the priest literally lifted their hands and pronounced a blessing over the people. Well, let's have that kind of blessing declared over our lives. If you, you don't want to chase money, you don't want to live your life with wrong priorities, you don't want success to blow you out, cause you to implode, you want to be resourced, have the kind of wisdom so that you'll stand even when God's blessing comes. You'll keep the main thing the main thing, keep your priorities right. Well, if I'm talking to you, lift your hand up right now. And Father, you know the hearts of people. And Lord, I thank you, you are for us and you are not against us. I thank you that you are on our side. Lord, I thank you in Jesus' name, we can trust you with our very lives. I ask, Lord, in your mighty name, that blessing indeed may chase down your people. Father, I pray that we may know in the most pure sense prosperity and good success. Father, I pray that we can have the kind of wisdom that God who stores up success, you have a store filled with success, that you will pour it into people's lives, that then, Father, we can live our lives making a difference, seeing the salvation of the earth, seeing, Father, your will be done here on earth as it already is in heaven. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen.
just at the conclusion of this service, would love to lead people here in a powerful prayer of knowing Jesus Christ. You know, I believe here in the message tonight, the message of blessing, the message of God's purpose over every single person in this place. The reality is God has a plan and a purpose for every single person in this place. Whether you're here for the first time, whether you're still trying to work it out in an environment like this and you're kind of figuring it all out, the reality is God has a plan and purpose for you. This is not about a religion or rules and regulations, but this has always been about a relationship with the awesome person of Jesus Christ. And tonight, he's on offer tonight. He wants to know you, friend. No matter where you come from, maybe you came with a friend or a family member, he wants to have a personal relationship with every single person. Maybe you come from a background where you've made a whole lot of mistakes, where you've come from a whole background of just sin and shame. Well, welcome to the party. You're standing a whole, standing amongst a whole bunch of people here who have made mistakes. But we have found through the person of Jesus Christ, His grace. And that has changed us and transformed us from the inside out. So just at the conclusion of this service, I'd love to give every opportunity for every single person to pray a powerful, simple prayer of saying, Jesus, I surrender everything. I surrender all. If that's you in this place, friend, let me lead you in the prayer. Can I have every head bowed, every eye closed, all over this place? Where do you stand right now when it comes to knowing Jesus? Do you know him as your personal Lord and Savior? If you don't, friend, I would love to lead you right now in this prayer. I'm talking from the youngest to the oldest, from the very front to the very back, from the left to the right. Where do you stand right now when it comes to Jesus Christ? Because he can give you a plan, a purpose, a future for your life. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to do something bold and courageous. I want you to raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it. And I'm going to pray for you right where you sit. If that's you all over this place while every Christian is praying, I'm going to pray for you right now. Already people are raising their hands. Is there anyone else that wants to know Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior? Just raise your hand high enough and long enough for me to see it right up through the back there. Anyone else all over this place up the floor here? This is amazing. Yeah, thank you. All over this place, people are raising their hands. I'll just give this just a few more moments. Friend, don't walk out of here not knowing the person of Jesus Christ. All over this place, people are raising their hands. This is amazing. Unreal. I'm going to give this one more moment. I'm going to count to three. And if you raised your hand just then, I want you to raise it again, just after the count of three. If you didn't, but you know that you should have, then this is your moment, friend. While every head is bowed, every eye is closed, is there anyone else that wants to raise their hands in surrendering their life to Jesus? You ready? One, two, three three all over this place raise your hands this is amazing unreal church can we give god a hand of praise for what he's doing in this place what i'm going to ask you to do right there in brisbane and the city is if you raise your hand just now i want you to say a prayer from the bottom of your heart and as a big church family we're going to repeat this prayer together are you ready come on let's close our eyes Dear Jesus, tonight I give you my life. I surrender all. Forgive me of all my mistakes and anything I've done wrong. I choose you now as my personal Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Come on, let's give God a hand of praise. Thank you. Listen, if you prayed that prayer, if you raised your hand, maybe you didn't. Hopefully one of our teams seen you there in Brisbane and the city as well. If you've raised your hand, someone's going to come and give you a Bible and they're going to put in your hands a gift on behalf of our church. It's an, uh, please take it as a gift on behalf of our church. If not, someone's going to be out in the foyer. They'd love to give it to you. They're going to be waving this Bible around. Walk up to them and say something like, hey, I prayed that prayer. C- can I have one of those Bibles? And we would love to put it in your hands. Come on, let's give God one hand of praise again. Amen. Amen. If I think about what I was preaching about tonight, and I think about Peter, who is my son-in-law, um, you know, this may seem like the silliest little thing to a lot of people, but Pete's on our team. He's our youth pastor, and he's a busy guy. And <laughs> he preached. He preached at Wildlife. Now, 
led here by Paul Calloway, but he preached on Friday night. And I hear you did a great job, by the way. But listen, here's the little thing. This is the little thing. The little thing is, I was preaching last night in the city. There's a million things Peter could be doing. He didn't have to come. And I turn up there, and Pete's there with my granddaughter, Willow. I said, what are you doing here? He said, I just wanted to support you. And you know something? It's the little things that opens people up. There's a million things he could be doing, a million reasons why he could. I mean, church is our life. We go to I don't know how many services every week. He didn't have to be there. And it's those little things, that mix between perspiration and inspiration, that lean in, that commitment, that sometimes literally sorts out the good and the great. I don't believe God just wants to do something good in your life. He is good. But I believe God is great and he wants to do great things. That's why, with that attitude, I believe for great things in your life. Amen. Amen. I'll probably find out afterwards there was actually another reason he was there, but that's at least, that's at least what he told me. That's what he told me. Okay, let's do some dancing. It's time for a knees up. It's time for a bit of Holy Ghost celebration. We need a good old knees up in this place. I remember the days when we used to sing, What a mighty God we sing. There we go. Let us go and praise the Lord. Do you know that one, Dave? Let us go and praise the Lord. Oh, what a pity. Do you want me to teach it to you? Okay, where's the band? Give me a note. Here we go. What a... What a mighty God we serve, everyone. What a mighty God we serve like this. What a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. Here we go. Let us dance and praise the Lord. Come on back there. Dance and praise the Lord. Let us dance and praise the Lord. Let us dance and praise the Lord. Why? For what a mighty God. These were the days. This is when they knew how to write songs. These songs were anointed. What a mighty. Here's the best part. Here we go. Let us run and praise the Lord. Come on. Let us run and praise the Lord. Let us run and praise the Lord. Let us run and praise the Lord. Why? But what a mighty God we serve. What a mighty God. Did you run? What a mighty God we serve. Come on, Jill. Let's dance and praise the Lord. 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 Why? For what a mighty God. Could you have picked a higher key, do you think? What a mighty God. Be blessed, have a great week, magnums for all the ladies. Let's not forget how special Easter is going to be. Amen. You up for it? Before you come down the front if you want to draw, we're gonna dance. Come on, take your hands up.
We're out of time tonight, guys. Be blessed and we'll see you next Sunday at church.